John Sawat used to recommend that when you start meditating, you try to develop an attitude of confidence, an attitude of clarity. Those are the meanings of the words, the word basada. Combine it with conviction, he would say, sata. Conviction that you're doing something really worthwhile. We're not here just going through the motions. We're working on something that's really good, training the mind. And whether the results are coming quickly or coming slowly is not the issue. So we're working on something that's really noble. There's dignity to what we're doing. We're stepping back from our usual concerns, our usual appetites, and really looking at the implications of our actions. And realizing if you're going to act in a way that's responsible, you really have to take responsibility for your mind. And that's what we're doing as we're meditating. So conviction that this is worthwhile and confidence that it can be done. The word conviction actually covers four things traditionally. Conviction that the Buddha really was awakened. Conviction that his Dharma is well taught. And conviction that the Sangha, the Noble Disciples, has practiced well. In other words, they've practiced in such a way that they reached awakening too. And when conviction in these three things is confirmed by the, your first taste of awakening, it issues in one other quality, which is that your, your precepts are clean. In other words, you're firmly established in the five precepts. And so even though your practice may not have reached the point where your conviction is verified, that you've really seen that these things are true. It's good to cultivate that attitude. You cultivate your precepts, and you cultivate your attitude towards the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. Those passages that we chant every evening, the recollection of the Buddha, the recollection of the Dharma and the Sangha, those are actually the passages that describe what verified conviction is like. And although some of the words may seem strange, it's good to reflect on the, the ones that do resonate, the ones that seem re relevant to your practice. And the Buddha was awakened through his own efforts. He was able to put an end to greed, aversion, and delusion. That's why he's a worthy one. That right there is something really important to be convinced of is because it reminds us that it is possible through human effort to put an end to suffering. It is possible through human effort to cleanse the mind. Sometimes you hear the idea that the, the ego is so corrupt that anything it tries to do is going to be corrupted as well. And that closes off all the doors, except for one door hoping that somebody's going to come along and save you. But that's being irresponsible. The responsible attitude is that you're responsible for the actions of your mind. You really can choose. Unfortunately, your motives are not always corrupt. As the Buddha said, you can take advantage of the fact that you want true happiness. 
and develop some noble qualities out of it, the qualities of purity, compassion, wisdom. Come from taking your desire for true happiness seriously. So these things are possible. It's part of the range of possibilities of being a human being. That right there is a challenge. The Buddha says, do you want to live your life keeping this possibility open, or do you want to close it off? And some people actually do want to close it off. They don't like the idea of the responsibility that comes from thinking that true happiness can be found through human effort. The mind can be cleansed through human effort. It asks a lot. But then what is life like when those possibilities are closed off? It's pretty miserable. remember when I first went to Singapore and I marveled at how planned everything was. And the sense of marvel was not totally positive. They had everything laid out for you. Where you're going to be born, what you're going to do as a child, where you're going to get your education, where they would channel you, and then you'd go to work, and then they'd have things planned out for your retirement. And then everything was planned for your death. And you figured, well, you just might as well go ahead and die and get it over with. If that was going to circumscribe your life. But thinking about the possibility that true awakening can be found through your efforts, that breaks through those circumscribed limits. That's not part of anybody else's plan, but that can be part of your plan. And to whatever extent you can nurture that conviction, it keeps you nurtured and nourished as well. As for the Dharma, the Dharma is well taught. In other words, the Buddha set things out clearly. I've been reading about the romantic attitude towards religious texts that you know, people gain a sense of oneness the deeper parts of themselves, oneness with the world around them, and then just express how wonderful that is. And the way they express it, of course, is going to be determined by their, their cultural background and their personal talents. But you look at the Buddha, and he wasn't that sort of person. He said the things that he experienced through his awakening were like the leaves in a forest. But he didn't waste his time telling us about what it's like to be awakened. He gave us the handful of leaves that shows how to do it for ourselves. So he's not just expressing how wonderful it is to be awakened, he's giving us descriptions of how to do it. And his descriptions are very precise, very clear. There's one passage where he compares his way of teaching with what he calls training in bombast. Training and bombast is we're taught things that are very poetical, that sound very high, very lovely, very inspiring. But no one is encouraged to ask, well, what precisely do you mean? Because in bombast there really is no precise meaning. It's all in the sort of the vague impressions. As the Buddha said, he taught cross-questioning. Your training was in cross-questioning. In other words, when there's a teaching you didn't understand, he encouraged you to ask, what's the meaning of this? What's the meaning of that? How far should this word be taken or this idea be taken? And that way, wherever there are any doubts or uncertainties, you can clear, clear them up. And the Buddha himself was open to cross-questioning. In fact, he took that so seriously that the next to the last thing he did before he passed away was to tell the monks, is there anybody who has any questions, any doubts, any perplexity about the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, the path of the practice? He made the offer three times. And even then, after the third time, he said, okay, if you're too embarrassed to speak in public, just talk to somebody who's right next to you. Which shows how earnest he was 
They didn't want to leave any doubts or perplexity behind. So we're not dealing with bombast or just poetic expressions. We don't have all that vagueness of trying to figure out well, what on earth does this symbolize and what does that symbolize, and this is, is this an allegory. The Buddha's words are like a training manual. They're meant to be put into practice, specific things that you do. Now, in some cases, he does leave it as a question, but it's a question that you can figure out on your own. We are trying to get the mind to settle down. Well, he says, Watch the breath as it's long, watch as it's short. Train yourself to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in, breathe out. Train yourself to calm the sense of fabrication that comes with the breath. These are all things that you can figure out before teaching breath meditation. He encouraged that you develop an attitude of patience. He said, "Try to be as non-reactive as the earth." People throw disgusting things on the earth, and the earth doesn't shrink back in horror. It just sits right there. And same with the other great elements. You can use water to wash away dirty things, and the water doesn't complain. The wind blows dirty things around, the wind doesn't complain. Fire burns dirty things, fire doesn't complain. In other words, you try to develop that quality of solidity so you can really observe things. It's to overcome that tendency of pushing and pushing and then getting frustrated and falling back and getting discouraged. Wanting things to be a certain way and then getting frustrated when they're not that way. If you're going to learn from meditation, you've got to develop this attitude of patience, solidity. Pose the question in your mind and just watch and try different things. Because the Buddha didn't stop his meditation instructions with equanimity. He then went on to teach the 16 steps of breath meditation, most of which involve training. There's an intentional element. You're trying to figure out a skill. Sensitize yourself to a certain area of your experience, either the body or your feelings, the state of mind. And then notice where is there stress, and then how you can calm that stress. In other words, these are things you do. You don't just sit there or give up. But if things aren't working, you to try to have that confident attitude. Okay, there's got to be a way out of here. You just haven't figured it out yet. Something you're doing, you're pushing in the wrong direction or pushing up against something in the wrong way. So you step back and watch for a while. So the Buddha is all very clearly laid out. So we don't have to keep it reinventing the Dharma wheel every time we practice. I mean, there are ways in which you learn how to apply general principles to your specific case. In this, in this way, you, there is a creative element in the practice. But you can rest confident that things were laid out clearly. Whatever's there in the Dharma is meant for you to use as part of the path to awakening. And then when you find awakening, you don't have to have anybody describe it for you. You know what it's like for yourself. As for conviction in the Sangha, that they've practiced well. That's useful for when comparing yourself to the Buddha seems a little bit unreal. And so you look at the members of the Sangha, men, women, young, old, educated, uneducated, rich, poor. Some people practiced quickly, got quick results. Other people took a long time, but they finally got the, the desired results. Sometimes it's most inspiring reading about the ones who were having the most difficulty. Because you look at their difficulties and you say, well, it's nothing compared to mine. And yet in the midst of that discouragement, they could 
find something that was worthwhile. And they had the conviction that carried them through, even when things looked pretty bleak. Their conviction is what enabled them to find a way out. It's like being lost in the woods. If you think that there's no way out, you're not going to find it. But if you're convinced there must be a way out, you keep looking and looking and looking, and regardless of how long it takes. It's a conviction that there's a way out. It's a necessary part of finding the escape. And that fourth element of conviction is learning to keep your pre precepts pure. It may seem strange that this is a kind of conviction, but for the Buddha, conviction isn't just conviction in ideas. It's something you actually put into practice. It has to find its way into your actions. If you really do want to develop compassion, wisdom, and purity, you first got to look at your actions. What are you doing? What's the impact of your actions? How scrupulous are you about doing things the right way? the harmless way. And the more you find that you can stick with your precepts, the more confidence you get in yourself. And at the same time, you're developing important principles, important qualities of mind you're going to need for the meditation, mindfulness, alertness, being observant. so that your actions are not at odds with your principles. And when all else fails, you remind yourself, like, I'm not harming anyone. That's really important. Because you look at the way the world is, and everybody seems to be nudging everybody else out of the way. To get what? Something is going to slip right through their fingers. And all they have left is the, the memory of the horrible things they did. Which is not a treasure of any kind. But here we're developing treasures. We've got the treasure of conviction. We've got the treasure of virtue. There's the treasure of a sense of shame, i.e. your sense of your own self-worth, that you'd be ashamed to stoop to harmful actions. The treasure of compunction, that when you think of doing something harmful, you just, you just pull back and say, no, I can't do that for fear of the harm. They've got four of the seven treasures right there, seven noble treasures. When you bring this attitude to the practice, you're starting with a good foundation. You're ready to learn from the meditation regardless of how well or how poorly it may go. Then you're in that position where you're not so neurotic that you have to pretend there is no such thing as poor meditation. Sometimes it just doesn't work. Okay, it doesn't work. Recognize the fact that it's not going well. Compose some questions in your mind. Okay, exactly what's going wrong? Tease things out. Is it the state of mind you're bringing? Is it the beliefs you're bringing? Is something wrong with the breath? Something wrong with the body? Something happened today that got you all stirred up? Learn how to separate these things out, so that regardless of how well or poorly the meditation goes, you know how to learn from it, learn how to benefit from it. And the lessons you learn or the benefits you get may not be the ones you've planned, but you've got to learn how to appreciate them. So that your sense of conviction stays strong gets more and more reliable.
because you learn to appreciate the results that you do get, regardless of whether what they're what you want in terms of the bliss, the rapture, whatever. But there are a lot of other important things to learn from meditation as well. And when you learn how to recognize them, they're all good.